Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to episode three, Case Studies in Connection. Uh, this keynote focuses on how federal agencies tapped into stories and figures in popular culture to promote our science. I'm Shannon Brush-Roche, the social media manager and senior writer editor in the Office of Sciences, Communication, and Public Affairs. With me today is Paul Lester, Barbara Addy, and Josh Shannon. Paul Lester, who's going to be talking first, is a public affairs specialist and social media manager for the U.S. Small Business Administration's Office of Communications and Public Liaison. You may wonder how this relates, but that's because he previously served a similar role at the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Public Affairs, where he managed the, office of the agency's social media accounts. Barbara Addy is a veteran of communicating with the public with over 20 years at NASA headquarters, and she currently serves as the Policy and Strategic Communications Director for the Space Communications and Navigation Program. This program provides the space communications and nav services for NASA and other customer space missions and develops leading edge technologies. She also serves on the White House OSTP National Quantum Coordination's Office's Interagency Working Group on Quantum Workforce Development and shares the passion with her teammates for engaging the broader American public and building the future workforce. Josh Shamit is the NSF National Science Foundation Public Affairs Specialist for Media Trends and Science Statistics. That's very exciting. He joined the agency in 2001, helping lead several of NSF's largest outreach collaborations, including the announcement of the image of a black hole. From 2013 to 2018, he worked in the private sector, including serving as the founding editor of the Expert Voices op-ed and features platform for space.com and its sister site, livescience.com, as well as developing a similar expert platform for Climate Nexus. Now we'll hear from each of our speakers, followed by a time for discussion. Uh, please hold your questions um, or put them in the chat until the speakers are finished and we'll discuss them as a group. When we get to that time, please use the chat function. And now that we're done with the credits, uh, it's time for the episode. Paul, want to start us off? Hey, everybody. Um, uh, so great to be here. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity. I see a lot of familiar faces on here. Hi, Rick. How are you doing? Um, and I'm just really excited to be back here at DOE and talk about Stranger Things, the sort of gift that keeps on giving to the energy department. Um, and I will, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about um, Stranger Things and what we did here, what we did at the energy department when I was there. Um, this was, uh, I was at um, the energy department uh, public affairs office from uh, starting in 2015 all the way to 2019. Um, and Stranger Things came out in um, 2016. And as you know, <laughs> on the show, um, they depicted uh, the energy department um, and the depictions weren't great, actually. Um, they, uh, one of the things that they depicted was the Hawkins Natural Laboratory, which doesn't exist, obviously. And um, in that lab, there's evil scientists like here, Dr. Brenner, um, and then there's also a thing that, you know, uh, Jenny mentioned earlier um, in, in her, her talk uh, about the uh, porthole to the another dimension um, that energy department scientists were, uh, were involved in and, and create, you know, a, a portal to the upside down, which is like this crazy, terrifying world. Um, so that's not, that's not great, a great depiction. Um, and um, it's, so as we were, what happened was um, when the show first came out, um, we didn't really know what to make of it because, uh, you know, people were emailing our office saying, you know, hey, this, you know, there's a show that came out that, that mentions uh, the energy department. And at that point, I was the only person who had watched it because um, I was like at home with the flu and I binge watched the thing and I had no idea. I was just sitting there watching the show. And all of a sudden, there's all these depictions of the energy department, and I was just like blown away. Um, but our office like wasn't sure, uh, public affairs office, we weren't like exactly sure what to do as far as like responding because um, initially it wasn't clear if like the show was going to be a hit or anything like that. Um, so this was like the early days, is like early, you know, 2016 August when it first came out. And um, apparently it must, must have not been a lot on TV <laughs> that, that summer because it was just the talk of everything um, that, that summer. Um, so um, 
when we first started ruminating about like, you know, how do we, how do we leverage this? And we know that, you know, it was starting to trend on social media and we have a very limited amount of time. So as we were, you know, as when you're responding to sort of a negative portrayal of, um, you know, of your agency or your organization in, um, in pop culture, um, you have to weigh the pros and cons. And, you know, we had sort of the sort of a list of things that we discussed um, as we were going through this uh, decision process was, you know, one of the things is like, we're energy department is rarely mentioned in television and film. Um, and this was like, you know, a really good opportunity to, to talk about, you know, our work, um, sort of like insert our, uh, insert ourselves into the discussion about Stranger Things. And, um, and then it, and then also um, gave us a chance to sort of debunk some of the myths or misconceptions about um, the agency, not only for the show, but just generally. Um, and then um, obviously uh, for the cons, um, you know, we're obviously we're concerned about being criticized by um, certain, you know, uh, members of the media or media outlets who are, you know, as you all know, there's, there's uh, outlets who go after government agencies and, and criticize you and in your work and say it's a waste of government, you know, money. And especially when you're doing something fun, um, I know that that is always, we are always being foyed about, you know, how much money, you know, how much time was devoted to your Halloween stuff. You know, like we did a whole uh, campaign on Halloween and, and, you know, energy savings and all this stuff. So we would get foyed on that. Um, and it could, you know, another thing is it could lead to more scrutiny of the agency but that being said, um, we thought the the risk was worth it, and um, you know it was a very, once in a lifetime opportunity, honestly, because you know how often does the entire show is based on your agency? So that was like a really cool uh, chance to to you know to talk about our work. Um, so uh, before we got going, you know we check with um, always the case is check with the lawyers. Um, I'm not a I don't know much about trademark or copyright or anything like that. I'm just a lowly public affairs specialist. Um, I actually don't even have like a strong science background. I came from, I uh, was in the news business for a while. Um, so, uh, so I always check with the lawyers uh, to make sure that they're, you know, what, what our plans were before and then after like the campaign, just so that they, they're aware of like how we're going to use like, you know, uh, the fonts and stuff and the, and you know, one of the things we try to do is avoid um, imagery and the video and music directly from the show as much as possible, um, just to you know avoid any potential legal fights with maybe Netflix or whoever. Um, <clears throat> so as far as like the actual uh, campaign, the initial sort of res quote unquote response, um, we turned we you know back then it was like 2016. There was a lot of like sort of like the whole. Uh, trend on on the internet to sort of like fact check you know we're doing uh you know fact checks on on um you know certain politicians or whatever like there's all these you know that that was sort of like a, a genre of like internet uh, and media um so we're like oh maybe we can just do a sort of a fun like fact check debunking type blog post um as you can see here um what the what stranger things didn't get quite so right about the energy department clearly tongue in cheek um, not serious, but also was able to um, allow us to talk about like, oh, there's no Hawkins lab, but we have all these other amazing laboratories. And then we don't have evil scientists. We actually have really amazing, incredible scientists who do important work that, you know, are transforming lives. Um, and, um, you know, there isn't, there isn't, a, you know, an upside down or whatever. So, um, but we'll get back to that later <laughs> because um yeah that's for season two um so and then this, the, that blog post the sort of debunking blog post was a sort of anchor for everything else that we did um on social media and then our good friends um at Oak Ridge National Laboratory were kind enough to do a sort of like impromptu um Facebook live uh Jenny thank you so much for helping us out with that back in the day 
um, she, she did a, you know, ask a scientist about Stranger Things, what it's like to, you know, work at a national laboratory, um, and you know what it, what an actual scientist does at, you know, at a national laboratory um, instead of like, you know, Dr. Dr. Brenner Brennan and, and his experimentations on on Eleven. So, um, so that was a cool um, a cool thing that that Oak Ridge helped us out with. Okay. So next slide. Um, so after um, after we published the blog post, um, you know, it actually did did okay on social media. We were hoping for a little bit more pickup, honestly. Um, but what really got people, um, you know, we, we got a lot of reaction from the the media itself, not not necessarily uh, social media. Um, so they were really interested in you know, how the blog post came about. Um, and um, so like there was, we had articles in, in Wired magazine. Um, we actually, on the left there, uh, that is actually like we, I, they actually interviewed me uh, because they wanted to talk to the author of the blog post and then um, our public affairs director at the time. And so we were able to talk about um, you know, in that interview, even though they really wanted to talk about, you know, point by point of what was in the blog post, um, we were actually able to talk about the interview department's work, which was cool. Um, so, and then this, you know, then we got, you know, picked up in Gizmodo and then uh, for NPR, actually the Duffer brothers, this was like probably a, like a week or two after um, the blog post came out, NPR, uh, 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 Ari Shapiro interviewed uh, the Duffer brothers who created the show and um, asked them to react to the blog post. So that was like totally not, we were not expecting anything like that. And then they just kind of like laughed it off. It was like, oh, we thought it was funny that the energy, the energy department like had to comment on the show. Um, and so that was like, you know, uh, you know, another, another fun media hit that we got. Um, yeah, so there was just lots of lots of buzz about it um, externally and also internally. Um, so uh, so yeah, I think like uh, you know for the most part, it, uh, the the initial blog post was a success. So one of the things, um, as I mentioned in the you know previously that you know we talk about you know there's there's the upside down and and one of the one of the bullets in the blog post was like you know, oh, we don't, you know, we don't work on, you know, we don't do anything with, with, you know, the upside down or parallel universes or whatever. But then, you know, actually the energy secretary at the time was like, hey, actually we do, so we kind of do, you know, similar work with, you know, you know, dark energy, dark matter. Um, so this is an opportunity. And then, um, so, uh, so as a follow-up, um, we actually um, did a, for our Halloween podcast, the Energy Secrets uh, Direct Current podcast that we have, we did a segment on Stranger Things and sort of like revisiting um, the blog post. Uh, this is actually right around the time for, for Stranger Things season two. So we timed it specifically for season, season two launch and Halloween. Um, and we inter interviewed um, Jim Seacrest and Michael Cook of the High Energy Physics uh, Office and talked about, you know, oh, well, you know, we do, we mentioned that, you know, we, we, we don't, you know, work on um, the, uh, you know, the alternative dimensions, but we do focus on, you know, dark energy, dark matter, and they discuss like our work there um, and sort of, you know, it was just a fun way to sort of tie in Stranger Things again and directly relate it to the energy department work and sort of correct the record. It was another like sort of tongue in cheek thing that we did We're like, oh, we actually have a correction to that. Um, so um, so based on that, we, you know, that was our anchor there. It was the, was a podcast. And then we, you know, we had some social media around that. In addition, we also had a, a blog post written by Jim um, or authored by Jim uh, Seacrest that we, well, it actually has a lot of the same points that we discussed in the, uh, in the podcast. So, so that was, um, that was our follow-up to the previous year and it kept sort of like the drumbeat of like stranger things in the energy department going. And again, we were able to talk about our work in a more productive way. 
interestingly, we didn't get as much media coverage on this, but we got um, some decent, um, some social media traction on it. So as a result of, of the campaigns, we got you know about over 225,000 impressions, 10,000 engagements uh, for web. You know, we got, we received that 78,000 podcast downloads, which was like one of our highest at the time. Um, and then the thousands of page views on our um, on our website, energy.gov. Um, so sort of the overall lessons learned from, from the experience, um, don't be afraid to, to insert yourself into the conversation about pop culture and science, but be strategic. I mean, I think like, you know, Stranger Things was, it was a good opportunity, but for instance, I can't imagine you're gonna talk about the Barbie movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the energy, the energy department's work. Um, so anything that's sort of like related to your, um, you know, to the work that your agency or organization does um, is, isn't a good opportunity. Uh, timing is super important. Um, you need to act while something is trending. Um, you, you know, we need, in order to capture the, the, the attention of of not only folks on social media, but the media generally, um, there's an opportunity to, to be relevant in a discussion. It's also the idea of sort of a news jacking, um, uh, but for pop culture. Um, and then also like, you know, think of other opportunities if you have something that's, you know, say, uh, say the Stranger Things, uh, you know, for the podcast, for the Stranger Things podcast or whatever, um, whenever the, think of the other opportunities to, you know, you work really hard at this, you're know, putting all this together. Um, think of other times to like repost it or, or share it again. Say there's a big announcement, uh, you know, for, for Stranger Things specifically, like there's an uh, announcement about, you know, the next season, uh, what date that is or whatever. And then if, if that's trending, you know, check and see if that's trending on social and then, uh, you know, push that, you know, podcast out again, um, you know, to sort of keep that Keep the momentum going and, and reintroduce uh, the content again. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that's that's about it. that's about it for me. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for this opportunity to discuss Stranger Things and, and my time. I really loved the you know working at the Energy Department and all the amazing work that that people do there and and just to be a part of that was was incredible and just like just to see you all again, it's just been amazing. So thanks for the thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences. Um, and Barbara and Josh, you're up next. And if folks have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or wait until after we're uh, done with the presenters for this uh, session. So instead of a campaign to address unexpected attention, which I still think is pretty epic, Paul, and respect on how you guys navigated that, um, ours is more of a pivot of trying to get attention when there's not necessarily a lot of motivation from the public to engage. Um, and what we'll show is even a commemorative day can get a boost from Hollywood, um, especially if there's a foundation of cross-agency collaboration. So this effort was led by Spiro Michaelakis from Caltech and Tom Wong at OSTP. Um, and it was the second year of doing so. It was a coordinated OSTP-led federal effort to highlight World Quantum Day. Um, in the end, we had nine agencies, sub-agencies involved, fully engaged, plus OSTP. And the primary goal uh, wasn't so much damage control as it was to inspire young people, um, trying to get teachers and parents uh, in particular engaged about quantum and getting the kids inspired about being part of the future quantum workforce. Uh, there is no current quantum workforce. It's folks who did other things first and then got into quantum. So how do we get young people thinking that they can be part of this new workforce that is, that is emerging. Um, so it's hard to get an audience for a day. We all know this, um, you know, to get a you know commemorative sort of audience, as opposed to getting an audience for like breaking news or a discovery or a space flight. Um, so the goal was to make a louder voice by coordinating all of the agency voices together and with our fan bases. And as Barbara's gonna discuss, um, bringing Hollywood definitely doesn't hurt. Um, she helped lead the production of the Anchor product, which was a video uh, coordinated by our Q12 education partnership. And the host that they found perfectly hit the mark to get to the target audiences and get to our goals. Um, in addition to that video, I'll just very quickly, before getting on to Barbara's discussion of all that, um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what the overall effort included. 
Um, there were nine agencies in OSTP coordinating closely on a wide range of social media multimedia products, including podcasts and YouTube explainers. And that went on before, during, and after World Quantum Day, as Paul mentioned as well. You know, it's important not to let something die as soon as the, the day passes, but to really keep, keep engaging again and again. Um, the agency is also directly engaged by a, a joint social media conversation. I'm going to detail that in a second. Um, the Q12 partnership connected 138 scientists to classrooms and was able to provide 2,500 quantum lesson kits to students, including an underserved community. So they got a lot of direct engagement from, from that. But the social media effort, where a lot of the attention from the agencies went, uh, reached more than 4 million impressions alone. Um, and as Barbara will show with the stats, half of that is NASA, and that's awesome because it was a huge amplifier. But it's also important that half of that was the other eight agencies. And so there's there's a lot to be said for this kind of everybody lifting each other up. Um, so by driving conversation, even news outlets did that picking it up. Um, Peak Wire, HBC Wire, Red Stories, and others. And that's not common for a celebratory science day. So just to wind up, um, the Twitter part of this, which I wanted to address in a little bit of detail, generated nearly 200,000 impressions. Um, and it was a leading launch path for that anchor video. And it included a multi-agency day-long conversation where the agencies engaged each other directly uh, as well as their audience. So the idea built on an informal Twitter conversation from our social lead, Laura Mar Rivera Diaz, that she created with Barbara Madsen at NASA Goddard back in 2019 for the first Black Hole Week. And it was this great informal back and forth between the two agencies on Twitter. So we ramped up the idea to all nine agencies and OSTP for World Quantum Day, and not just to grow the footprint, but when you get all those agencies talking, it helps us hit marks to boost search engine optimization. It gets all of those entities, those 10 agencies talking about the same thing at the same time. Um, so all, all of the Twitterverse kind of picks up on that a little bit. And so the, the idea was that each agency had a time, a specific set time to join that conversation, this, this ongoing Twitter conversation, very well coordinated. And they had a specific other agency account to respond to. So there was this back and forth, agency to agency to agency to agency. Uh, and they quoted the previous agency's tweet while adding their own. So there was this, this real intent to show conversation. Um, and despite the fact that we're federal agencies, they kept it pretty casual and relatively informal, although I think that's something that could be improved next time. The original Black Hole Week one was incredibly informal, it was great. And I think just as agencies get more comfortable with the format, it's something that can be done uh, more casually next time. But it was very tightly coordinated with timing and text. Um, for some agencies, this, this broad effort ended up being their most engaged social media outreach to date, um, especially again for an item that's not breaking news. Um, it helped us actually get out there as federal science being one voice, which we really just don't do. And we just don't do it enough we don't really do it at all. We'll occasionally work together, one, two, three agencies maybe doing a press release, but we are federal science. We should be speaking together more often to, to kind of generate interest and lift each other up. Um, and we did prove to a number of agencies that this kind of thing can work uh, and that some of the hurdles that they thought existed didn't really exist, uh, even from legal. And I agree with Paul 100%, always go to counsel, get advice and guidance. Um, but with that guidance, folks were able to really do some interesting things. Um, so most importantly, the effort did spur a national conversation that intertwined our various fan bases, uh, including kids and parents. And hopefully it's going to generate some sustained interest that we can continue to spark uh, throughout the year. And so with that, I will mute and turn it over to Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. While you're doing that, I'll just say that one of the main focuses of this interagency effort was the um, flagship video. We had asked the agencies and the labs and everybody else to contribute videos and materials during that focused World Quantum Day. Um, but there was also a flagship that was that was shared broadly. So I'll, I'll share a um, two minute version of it shortly. We also did a seven minute version. This was put together by Dr. Emily Edwards, who um, is on contract with NSF which was a major um, uh, focus of uh, producing this video. And what we did is we pulled together a smaller team of um, the, the non-scientists and the non, um, uh, mostly the creative leaders who could put together 
materials. How do we want to express ourselves um, to the public? We knew we wanted to reach the broad uh, American students across the country of all, you know, small cities, small towns and big cities and people everywhere. We also wanted to reach um, uh, the teachers and the parents and the guardians and the um, school counselors, the people who would um, be influencing the students. Now, like I said in a previous, um, the previous episode, NASA does have a contact with Hollywood that they work with closely because we do get um, people who ask us um, about uh, part participating in various movies such as The Martian. This one um, is not about NASA, it is about a particular technology. So it is not, it is not NASA focused. Um, so what we did is we went with some um, people that we do know in the field and they were able to reach out to LeVar Burton who has a strong presence in the community for being a <clears throat> comfortable person <clears throat> to represent science, to represent education and somebody that the teachers and the parents would relate to. Um, so this, this focuses on uh, various scientists who are of various ages. Um, they have represent various audiences. We wanted to make sure that the students could see themselves in these, in the um, people who were presenting. So there's a wide variety of uh, representatives speaking in this video. And we also have Dr. Josh Cassida, who is a quantum physicist astronaut who was on board the space station while we were in the production phase and he agreed to produce some uh, to share some video. So he is in this video as well and we're hoping that um, students were able to relate to this as they as it was shared. And as we um, found from the numbers, we had excellent response from the students and from the general public. So um, that was basically what I wanted to share. The other thing that I wanted to note is <clears throat> we wanted to um, also reach out to families at home. Um, and so we, we reached out to Jeopardy. Jeopardy is known for decades to have a large audience with the national, uh, American public. Um, we know that not everybody's gonna end up as a quantum scientist. And we know that uh, the people who watch Jeopardy are generally the, um, the nerds of the, the country across the country. And so we reached out to Jeopardy and through Dr. Spiros Michalakis at Caltech, who has contact there, he was able to reach out. They were very interested in participating in World Quantum Day. And he, he produced nine clues for World Jeopardy, I mean for Jeopardy for World Quantum Day that were used as a special category with video. And then the extra, the extra ones clues that were produced were used um, at various other points at other episodes. So they have agreed that they are very interested in this. Thank you for that, Tom. And they are um, interested in sharing it again next year. So World Quantum Day 2024 will hopefully also have a Jeopardy and um, video. And we are gonna be focusing on reaching out to the, the teachers this year because we know that this content can be difficult. We wanna make sure that teachers are comfortable sharing it. Oh, thank you. So this is um, the Jeopardy information and um, the number of views that we were, the impressions we were able to have. We also had NASA um, reach out during Quantum Mania to Paul Rudd and they produced a video, a short video as well, talking about some of the um, science of Quantum Mania. So there were two videos, a broad audience, and thanks to the interagency group, we were able to reach out um, broadly. And I think that was all I wanted to share at that point. I'm open to questions. And uh, I know Tom hopefully will have some input he could share as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's now time for a q and A. I'm going to just start with a question uh, from me and then move on. Um, what was your biggest lesson learned um, from your experiences leveraging pop culture for science communication? And if you could, uh, if we could highlight Paul as well, since he will also be answering the questions. Uh, who would like to start? Biggest mm. lesson learned. 
I guess I can go. I think like timing, as I mentioned in the, um, you know, the presentation is, you know, when something's trending, you have to like act quickly and hop on those trends. Um, I think it would have been great if we would have been given a heads up from Netflix that they're doing an entire series about the energy department that we could have planned better. And like, you know, it would have been nice to have that, you know, leeway or whatever to, to like get, to get started and figuring out other ways, because I think like a blog post was great, but it was also, there were so many other things we could have done in that initial launch or, or initial campaign kickoff. Um, and honestly, like there were tools that weren't available. I think like, you know, Facebook live was there, but we didn't have Instagram live, which would have been a really cool thing. Um, but yeah, I think like just the timing and doing it quickly and also, you know, just, you know, just checking, checking in with, uh, you know, the, your lawyers and, and people within the agency, um, making sure that they feel comfortable, um, you know, if, if you're, you're involving other offices or, or people, you know, within the agency or organization, make sure that they are included in the, you know, um, uh, in the rollout of things. Um, I mentioned in, in, you know, in, in the chat that, you know, for the second, especially for the second um, uh, round for the season two, we, we made sure, you know, we work very closely with Office of Science um, to, to like, you know, on script, on the script and, and getting reviews and, and making sure that, you know, they provided the, the, the interview subjects. Um, so, when you have buy-in from like internally from internal folks, like that is, is so huge. So and then Barbara or Josh or both. Uh, lessons learned or mainly I think one lesson learned is to um, try to reach students where they are with with um, people that they feel comfortable with, you know, so that they're used to having social influencers, social influencers. And um, yes, everybody can be a social influencer, but there are certain faces that are familiar, certain faces that they are comfortable with, um, speaking in, in language that they are comfortable with. So I think making sure that you're reaching people where they are in a way that they are comfortable. Yeah, I agree. I think the other lesson I picked up, uh, one that Spiro mentioned quite a bit, which is it's about the relationships. So people think of influencers as the outcome. You know, oh, can they tweet this and get me a million views? They don't want that relationship. Um, and honestly, it only pans out that one time if you get it. But what you really are trying to do is create good rapport with folks who can engage with you uh, in the in the long term. Um, and well, in this case, Lavar Burton, I don't know. I, I'm not the main point of contact for him. So, but hopefully, he now has. Uh, relationships with folks who can sort of speak to him about some of these science issues. We know he does engage on it. And we also know he is one of the leading national voices on education and reading. And he just has maintained that his whole life and, and straight through the Star Trek. Um, and so, and in fact, now from what I understand is much more inspired to do things related to that than anything related to Star Trek. So he, um, you know, I, so from my vantage, it's not so much that I had any direct relationships, but it certainly was less than I created through it. I, I did want to oh, sorry. Yeah, jump in. There was a question about getting the agencies to work together. And I yes. think this is a really important one. Um, the first thing is understand that, yes, this can be done. Um, everybody's going to put up obstacles and concerns. And I think Paul is our case study for what is the worst possible scenario that could ever happen doing public engagement. And yet they turned it into, you know, that sow's ears turned into a first. And I think, you know, in this case, what was the worst that could happen? You know, it's there's nothing even remotely comparable to those other elements. So we were able to kind of get everybody just talking. Tom did a fantastic job recruiting the first time and recruiting this time. Spiro did a fantastic job engaging individually with folks. Um, it really brought folks together. And what what comes from the, the what we did was we had in terms of the specific, we had recurring meetings. Uh, once a month to start, and then once every couple of weeks, and then once a week as we got closer. And for those of you who've done some of these major press conference engagements, that's sort of a, a model that we've all followed when we're doing breaking news. 
And so everybody's on the same page and it may not be everybody from the same agency at every meeting, but those folks develop relationships again and those relationships develop trust. And then you start talking more creatively and you start reaching out to your leadership and others and council and figure out what can we do. And in the end, this, this is a perfect example of something that World Quantum Day is not something that everybody waits for every year unless you're a quantum physicist or quantum scientist. So how do you generate interest in something that's just out of the blue? Nobody's going to their computer each morning thinking, I want to learn more about World Quantum Day. But one way to do that, not the only way, but one way, uh, in addition to recruiting Hollywood, is getting a lot of voices speaking together. Well, one thing we have to remember as federal agencies is our voices count when you look at how the world gathers information these days. When you look at how search engines work, when you look at how people look for authoritative voices, despite commentary that may be out there, the reality is those models look to us and those people look to us. And so when we work together, it really elevates the whole thing. So it was close engagement, good relationships, trust, and then kind of pushing the edges to figure out what we could do. And then I think the last bit was great coordination. Tom created a document we all uploaded all of the different tweets and things. And again, nobody said, you can't say that, you can say that. We all said what we wanted to, but we all also could see what other folks were saying. And some folks kept some things close hold because they might've had something surprising they wanted to do, and that was fine. Um, it all kind of built together to, to create this one boy. And I think we should be doing it all the time. It looks like our stats did come up suddenly. Yes, I was able to pull them up. I figured out what the problem was. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, so those are the stats. Um, and that sort of speaks to uh, not completely, but what Rick's question was, was for both case studies, how did you measure impact? And specifically, not just how many people saw it, but what cognitions, attitudes, or behaviors changed? And how did the national conversation change the conversation or was it just the same people that we always reach? And I think that's a very provocative question, but a really important one. And do we have a way of knowing that is part of it? We do. I think one of the things I'll emphasize, it's not always the same people all the time. And one of the beauties of having us crosstalk is we're meeting our each other's audiences, which for Air Force is very different, for DOE is very different from NSF. And, I think NASA has the broadest, understandably, um, but it, and it may cross over with others, but you're trying to find ways to get that crosstalk. And it's not just the Twitter conversation was a way to introduce all these other things to all the others. So you're, you're creating bridges and new opportunities for people to see things. Plus, it's important to note that through the multimedia, both the anchor video and the other products being produced, people were cross-sharing those things too. And, and so you really are generating this broader conversation, trying to reach new audiences in new ways. There are people who will be searching for Paul Rudd, for example, that are gonna run across that in ways they wouldn't have expected. That particular video wasn't coordinated with this group. And that was unfortunate because it kind of meant that that video stood alone when it could have been integrated into all these other audiences and branches. Um, so there's work to be done, but I think it does serve a good purpose. Reach. Oh, he was saying that's the reach, but what was the impact of the reach? Like, is there a way to measure how much they learned or how their attitudes changed or how many kids were interested in pursuing quantum afterwards? That sort of thing. And so this is a great question for us on the Fed side, because the, that a lot of that we can't ask unless we create specific surveys. However, um, I will say that we did get feedback and Tom may have more of these. Uh, but we did get specific feedback from teachers talking about the impact on their classes, talking about how they did engage talking about their excitement about it. Um, I think what you're raising is an excellent point. We need better ways to gather metrics. We need better ways for agencies to understand the impact of any action or activity. Um, but we also need to know, you know, when something's reaching somebody, it's not just the stat. We really want to see, you know, you might reach 200 people and if those 200 people become quantum physicists or quantum mathematicians or whatever it might be, that's a win. And I think too often in our agencies, we're asked to gather you know, data and show how many clicks or how many views when the reality is what was the broader sustained impact. So I think that's an important conversation to have. We also developed educational materials um, to be used in the classroom in concert with the video. We wanted to make sure that it was more than just a one day event. And so some of you may be familiar with from your kids with the game Kahoot, 
um, which is used in classrooms. They provide material and then there's a quiz at the end of a particular set of material and the classroom can look together to see what the results are. It's all done on computer. Um, and so we developed two games on quantum and did have classrooms playing that. So that tells you that it's being used. We can't tell you how much a child learned um, necessarily, but we can tell that they were they were engaged. Great, we've got a couple more minutes left. Um, I think this might be our final question, unless we're very short about it. Um, Keegan, uh, and this is a question specifically for Paul. Could you share more about your target audience? Who are you trying to convince that DOE National Labs are wonderful research institutions with interesting scientists working for the public good? Were you concerned about what happened if people remained unconvinced? Yeah, so our target audience, as it always is, is the general public and specifically the sort of science curious, um, you know, uh, who may not have ever heard of the energy department or know anything about what we, what our work is, but, you know, sort of like people who are interested in science fiction. Um, and, you know, I think Stranger Things was was a great like show for you know you know a platform to talk about that um and, and the agency's work so um as far as like you know are, were we effective in you know reaching those people i think um through honestly i think through a lot of these these media hits that we got um you know folks who who read wired or motherboard or you know maybe listen to npr and heard the Duffer Brothers interview, um, we were able to connect with folks. I mean, it's hard to know exactly if they were quote unquote convinced that, you know, uh, that we're like, you know, this amazing agency, but we got, we got into the conversation and to us, that was a win. Um, it didn't necessarily have to be like a game changing, like, you know, maybe we should have loftier goals and like, but, but I think initially it was just like, you know, this is an opportunity for us to discuss what, you know, what we do at the agency and, and we were able to do that. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's my take on that. Thank you. And um, there were a couple other questions. I thought that was gonna be the last one, but we have a little bit more time. Um, and then uh, asked about the, oh, what media platforms do you find effective to use when engaging the public and or developing potential partnerships with organizations or other related agencies? Great question. Thank you, Ryan. And anybody can answer that one. Um, just from my perspective, like at the SBA specifically, um, we've been doing a lot of, I mean, this is not related to pop culture, but we've been doing a lot of collaboration like um, on Instagram, um, we do um, collaborate, co collaborative posts, like we did uh, one for um, with the IRS for during the tax uh, as tax season was 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 winding down. Um, that performed really well. It was a co. It was a you know Instagram allows you to do a you know collaborative post and then it shows up on both accounts or or as many I think you can include multiple agencies and it shows up as one post throughout all of the platforms so I found that from from, a, from my perspective here is, is a really good way to to collaborate with other uh, federal agencies and organizations so um, that's been really effective for, for me on my end here And uh, one last question from Don, who asked, how do you choose, uh, I'm sorry, exact question. How do you choose a, um, a spokesperson? And I think in this, all three of these cases, we didn't really have a spokesperson except for LeVar Burden. Um, so I think maybe that's what that's referring to. Like, how do we, how do we decide on LeVar Burden? So there are actually, if you look at the, if we can see the longer version, which is seven minutes, there are several, right. several different spokespeople. Right. And right. Um, Emily Edwards did find those um, individuals um, to represent us. Dr. Josh Cassida, who you had up on the screen there briefly, um, he is a quantum scientist. And so he, he just 
you know, was an obvious selection for us for how to express quantum and space and combine, you know, if we could have put dinosaurs in there too, we would have done that. Um, but we thought that would be a good way of um, engaging students. Um, and we talked quite a bit about who would be best to represent as the spokesperson. And uh, we, we chose LeVar Burton uh, because we, of his reputation as an educator, um, as rep being recognizable, um, to have the parents and the teachers uh, feel comfortable with him as somebody who could share knowledge in a, in a way that wasn't scary. We know that quantum could be a scary word for people. And fortunately, we had somebody who had a direct contact with him. And so um, that made it a lot easier to have somebody who could reach out and he was able to do this for us um, out of the goodness of his heart and for his interest in the, in the topic. So that was amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for everyone. Um, thank you to all our presenters and to the audience for being a terrific audience and being patient with us. It's now time for our commercial break, as they used to say in Saturday morning cartoons. After these messages, we'll be right back.